So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. I'm going to start off tonight in the New American Standard Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. The scripture says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things. Somebody say new things have come. Verse 17, once again, therefore, if anyone, I like that word anyone, regardless of what your history has been, you qualify as anyone. Regardless of what you did last summer, you qualify as anyone. If anyone is in Christ, you know, it's kind of like when you, well, it's not like it. It's way better. You know, when you want to get a car and they have those signs that say good credit, bad credit, no credit. We work with anyone. They'll do anything to make a deal with you. Um, we serve a God who works with the lowest of the low, the brokest of the broke. But the qualification is a desperation and a desire and a surrender to him. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. This is the word of the Lord and the church said, Amen. I want to teach tonight from the topic, you have the right to act brand new. You have the right. You have permission. It's okay to act brand new. Holy Spirit, would you guide this moment as we open up the scriptures that life would leap off of the pages. Father, your word is already blessed, but we want to be a blessed people. Blessed and happy are those who keep your law. Your law being your ways, dear God, and you have laid out ways for us according to the New Testament scriptures, and we want to follow those ways. But most importantly, we want to know you. We want to know you. And in knowing you and loving you and following you, you teach us how to live for you. So teach us tonight how to better live for you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Over the past few weeks, we've been dealing with the gospel, we've been teaching and preaching about the gospel. I told you a few weeks ago on Resurrection Sunday that you must be born again. We've been dealing with what it means to be converted. We've also been understanding what the gospel is in terms of uh, worldview and how Christian believers see the world. And we've learned a few things about the gospel. I'm not going to go over everything that we've learned over the past few weeks, but, but we are going to start here. The word gospel means an announcement of good news, victory, and battle. There was a messenger that would come to a battleground and pronounce and announce and proclaim that victory had been won. And so the gospel is a pronouncement. It's an announcement. It is a proclamation. It is, it is spoken. It is verbal. It is written. Um, there is good news that comes to those who trust in Jesus Christ. It is an announcement of good news, victory, and battle. And if there is a battle, there must be opposition. So the question is, who is the opposition? Here's the opposition. First off, Satan. The adversary is opposition. You need to know that there is an adversary. You've heard him and heard of him, his many names. Um, Satan, Lucifer, the devil, he is our adversary. He's an adversary to God, and he's an adversary to God's people. You need to know that Satan is real. Satan is real. You may not understand everything about him, but you need to know that there is evil in the world. If there's good, then there's evil. If there's light, then there is darkness, and there is a prince of the darkness. His name is Satan. He is wicked. And actually, hell, according to scripture, was created for him. That is going to be his final eternal resting place. He got kicked out of heaven along with a few other angels who followed him. In addition to having an adversary, Satan, there are demons. And these demons do operate in the unseen world. And because of their allegiance to Satan, they will suffer the same fate. But here's what Satan attempts to do. He's trying to take as many people as possible to the place that was reserved for him. He is trying to lead people and deceive people to go to hell with him. And so, because we live in what we call a fallen world, 
We need to know that those who are in Christ, they now receive eternal life and they are rescued from eternal death, which is hell. You see, hell is eternal separation from the Father. Uh, Hell, and it's hard to understand it because none of us have been there, and quite frankly, I don't want to go. I don't need to have a vision of what it looks like, and I don't need all of that. I just need to believe the word of God and scriptures indicate that there is a heaven and a hell, and that's enough for me. I want to go to heaven. I want to be with Jesus, and I want to be with the Father, and and I want to be free from the presence, the penalty, and the power of sin. So you have Satan, who is our adversary, but then in the scriptures, we have another opponent, and that opponent is sin. Sin is the rebellious and disobedient nature of humanity. That not only do we have an adversary, Satan, but there's something within us that rebels and is disobedient to God. That is sin. Sin is like cancer. It's not really alive, but it replicates itself and it adapts to a host and an environment. And it grows and it grows and it grows until it is checked and dealt with. And sin entered into the human narrative when Adam and Eve disobeyed God. And they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God told them if they ate of that tree that they would surely die. They ate of the tree, they disobeyed God, their eyes were open, and now we see all the effects and the impacts of sin throughout humanity. So we have Satan as an opponent, and now we have to deal with the reality of sin. And the scripture is clear that sin leads to death, which is the third opponent that we have to overcome. Death is the consequence of sin. And so there were things that died unseen the moment that Adam and Eve ate of the tree. Their relationship with God died. They no longer had full freedom in the presence of God. There was now a gap. They were kicked out of the garden, and now they would have to suffer in more ways than one. And then they eventually died a physical death, and everyone after that has died a physical death because of what they did. And death keeps on perpetuating time and time and time and time again and we also see the impacts of sin on the culture so not only did they die as individuals because of their sin now we see things like murder we see their their son um, Cain and Abel Uh, we see Cain murdering Abel now we see blood being shed we see animosity between other humans and people we see the impacts and the effects of sin and wickedness and people working and operating in systems, demonstrating sin and wickedness. And so when the gospel declares victory and battle, this is what has been overcome. Satan, sin, and death. The bad news is that we live in a world where there's an adversary in the unseen places who's impacting what's happening on earth, Satan. The bad news is that sin is a reality It's within all of us, and we cannot deal with it in and of our flesh. The bad news is that because we are sinful and we are not holy and God is holy, then the only right penalty for us is death. But the good news is that Jesus Christ came. He conquers Satan through his death and his resurrection on the cross. He conquers sin, and he conquers death. That's what occurred when Jesus sacrificed his life, and now the resurrected king... This is a song, is resurrecting me. Now, if I believe in Jesus because he conquered Satan, he conquered sin, and he conquered death, then I too can conquer Satan, sin, and death vicariously through his victory because of what he did. I now can share and partake in his victory because when I surrender to him, I become alive in Christ. There's bad news, but then there is good news. Now, We talked about Satan, sin, and and death, and I want to walk through and just further elaborate on the bad news. Uh, Number one, we've already established this, we are born in sin. Okay, we are born in sin. You and I were born in sin, and that is a problem. Psalm 51 and 5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. We have to teach our kids how to do right. We have to teach our kids to stop hitting We have to teach our kids to to care for other people. We have to teach our kids to not be selfish. 
to have any witnesses in here. We have to teach our children how to tell the truth. We have to teach them. Why? Because they're born in sin and shaped in iniquity. That is all of us, and according to the scripture, we come from our mother's womb. This disease of sin was passed on through the bloodline. We are born in sin. That's how we start. So we are born in a difficult predicament. Furthermore, number two, we understand that the consequence of our sin is death. So not only are we born in sin, but now we have consequences, and the consequence is that death is what we earn. Romans 6 and 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. Wages, these are things that we earn through our actions, and we earn through our rebellion and our disobedience. We are earning, we have a paycheck based on our sin. Now I want you to think about this. When you work a natural job, you exchange hours for money, and there's someone in HR who accounts for the amount of hours that you work, and at the end of the work week, you expect a paycheck based on what you earn, right? That's a good paycheck. Now, I want you to think about every time you do something that you're not supposed to do. In the spiritual sense, you're building a tab. In a spiritual sense, you are earning not income, but you're earning a debt. And, 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 and every time you lie, every time you cheat, every time you've lied, and every time you lie, every time you've kind of fudged information, every time you, you rebelled in your heart and your parents asked you to do something, you said, I ain't doing that. Another mark. Every time God told you to do something, you didn't do it. Another mark. Every time you, you didn't forgive someone when they harmed you. Another mark. Every time you looked at someone and you said, that's a fool. Another mark. Every time that you had hateful thoughts towards a person. Another mark. Can you imagine if you saw a tab of every single sin you've ever committed in your life? And imagine if there was a dollar amount attached to every single sin. You would see a debt and you would see a receipt a mile times a mile times a mile times multiple miles long. The wages of sin is death. That's what we earn being born in sin, shaped in iniquity. According to the scriptures, we earn death through our sins, but... The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And before Christ, this is the third thing you need to understand, we are eternally dead in our sins, apart from Christ. So we're born in sin, shaped in iniquity, and we are eternally dead in our sins, apart from Christ. We dealt with this on Sunday. We'll walk through it again in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. It says, and you were dead. In your trespasses and sin. So remember, what if we calculated every single thing that we did that was offensive to God, every single thing that we did to harm ourselves or harm other people, and there was a running tally, we would never be able to pay off that debt, and we were just dead in our trespasses and our sins. We were completely overwhelmed and overtaken by the reality of how often we mess up And then, because we serve a holy God, messing up once is enough to disqualify you. Dead in our sins and our trespasses, verse 2, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. That word walk speaks to lifestyle. So prior to you being saved, if you are saved, the scripture says that you walked according to the course of this world. You had behavior and lifestyle that was in sync with the world rather than being in sync with God. And the scripture continues to say that you walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air, Satan, and of the spirit that is now working on the sons of disobedience because we've identified that sin is rebellion and obedience. We are all born in it. And this scripture is making a strong case, and it, it, it offends many. Because so many people are living their best life now. Not realizing that they're dead in their sins. 
And because they might feel like they're a good person, because they might feel like they check all the different boxes or they've got a better way, according to the scripture, we were all dead in our sins and our trespasses, and we walked according to the course of this world and, of course, to the prince of the power of the air. And there's a spirit of the sons of disobedience, and it was working not just in them, but it was working in us. Continues verse number three. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh. We all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh. Prior to giving your life to Jesus, you did what you felt like doing. You did what you thought was right. And depending on how you were feeling, depending on whether or not you were hangry or fed, Depending on whether or not you felt loved or attacked. Depending on what was influencing you in some seasons, it was the music that you were listening to and the music influenced you to do certain things. Turn off the lights. Light a candle. You heard the song and were influenced by it and then begin to walk according to the lust of your flesh because you had not yet encountered the life-giving, transformative power of Jesus where you are saved and born again and then he places the Holy Spirit inside of you, which is why after you were saved, if you're saved, after you were saved, the things that used to trigger you and bring you to a place of the flesh before you were saved, now you have to challenge because the Spirit of God is within you. But prior to being born again, we are led by the lust of our flesh. Well, you're saying, well, I was a, a pretty moral person. According to the Scripture, our morality apart from Christ is always crooked. If we're the ones setting the standard, it's always crooked because you know how wishy-washy you can be. I know how wishy-washy I can be. I make a commitment. I'm going to go to the gym every day. A commitment I make with myself. I see the evidence. I see the need. I know the good. I make the commitment myself. I'm good for a few days. I'm good for a good week's. And then I let myself down. You say, I'm going to eat this, and I'm going to eat that, and I'm not going to eat this, and I'm not going to eat that, and you're good for four or five days, but then you make an exception of the rule that you created for yourself because your ruler is crooked. We make exceptions for ourselves that we wouldn't give to other people because we're the king of our castle, and we do what we want. And apart from Christ, this is the philosophy and the mindset that we have. And sometimes we had good intentions, and good intentions led us to, to, to not good results. Because we were lost. We were blind. We were operating out of passion. We were operating out of game theory. That's why some of us are so jacked up with relationships and stuff right now. You was watching them 90s movies. You've taken uncle and auntie's advice. But they didn't know any better. But you were just grasping for whatever wisdom you thought you could get. Sometimes it was the very first person that brought information to you. You trusted them. It's called the law of first truth. And then you adapted it into your life. And it took you a long time to realize that it was bad information. That's when we discover that we're hopeless out par apart from Christ because everything that we try doesn't work. Led by your lust. That's what the scripture says. And you can like it or lump it, but that's what it says. We all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh. Watch this, indulging the desires of the flesh. And you didn't just like mess up and then try to get better. You indulge. That word indulge, it's just sometimes, I can't even say it, just don't, you know, it's just indulge. Indulge, you know, you see the ice cream that says indulge, can't have too much of that. Because when you indulge, it, 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 it feels good to you, tastes good to you, but it's bad for you. But it's indulgence, so you keep coming back to what's bad for you 
and you just can't help yourself. The scripture says, we indulge in the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And watch this. This is what the scripture says about me and what the scripture says about you before Christ. We were by nature. You were naughty by nature. (laughs) By nature, we were children of wrath. Now, one could say, you know what, I really wasn't that bad, and, you know, I really wasn't that, but, but according to the scripture, the problem is that the fact that you were sinful and led by your lust made you children of wrath, which meant that if the wages of sin is death, that means that you earned the wrath of God prior to Christ, and someone has to deal with that debt, and someone has to deal with that judgment. We were children of wrath. We were literally enemies of God. Christ died for the ungodly. That word ungodly speaks to the fact that God was on one side, Satan was on the other side, and in the reality of this world, either you're on God's side or you're on the other team. You must pick a jersey to wear. You can't have one of them fashion jerseys that split down the middle one team on one side, one team on the other side, that's deception because being on the other team just a little bit is a declaration that you haven't given everything to God. So opposition, we were on one side or the other. And listen, sometimes we thought we were doing something. We thought we were living good. We thought we had it going on. But according to the scripture, we were dead in our trespasses. That sounds extreme, but that's what the scripture says. Because unless you die, you cannot be born again. If you're still holding on to the previous life and you feel like there was something redeemable about it, then you don't understand the process of dying to self And the apostle Paul is the greatest example of this because he was a Pharisee who actually persecuted Christians. He was highly educated, highly regarded, and he counted all of it rubbish because he was on the wrong side. He said, I counted all rubbish. Listen to me. Are you willing to acknowledge that your life was trash before Jesus? Are you willing to go to that extreme and to be honest. You ought to be careful how you get nostalgic about the good old days. (laughs) How you reminisce on times past. You remember when we, you know, hopped in the car and drove to that place and did, well, why would I want to go back to Egypt? Why would I want to be like a dog returning to its vomit? And the the more mature we get in the scriptures and the more we grow in Christ, the more we realize how lost we were. I'm talking to those of us who are saved. Have you ever reflected, the more you learn about Jesus and reflected on things you used to do and begin to weep when you realize how backwards, how wicked, how harmful, how, how disrespectful you were to yourself and to other people? But thank God for his mercy and his grace. In order to be born again, you got to die. But here's the thing. We want to take so much of who we were and bring it into who God is trying to make us. But you have permission to act brand new. You, You have permission to make a hard cut. You have permission to let the past be the past. And watch this. Embrace the newness of life that God has for those who trust in him. But the devil deceives us. We scroll and look at everybody else. It looked like they're having a good time. The grass sure does look greener on the other side. But listen, let me tell you something about this life, this life that we live in, the lust of the flesh, the the lust of the the, the flesh, the, the pride of life. All that glitters ain't gold. And the enemy appeals to our eyes. He appeals to our senses. And and, and here's the problem. Sometimes we reminisce on the way things used to be rather than desiring the way things shall be when Jesus returns. We we, we get bent out of shape because it seems like things are tough now. And, And let me help you out. I try to prepare people for this. Just because you get saved 
doesn't mean that everything's going to be good. Just because you get saved and you give your life to Jesus and you're born again, it doesn't mean that now all of your dreams come true. Because many of us, when we got serious about our walk with Jesus, our dreams died. only to be born again with us. And and when we really get into this thing, we desire new things. We desire the newness of life, that Zoe life that Jesus talked about. We know bios life, that's just existing, but Zoe life is a whole nother level of living that extends itself into heaven, but God gives us a taste of heaven on earth. No, not through the change of society because society is getting worse. No, not necessarily through all of the different things that people value on earth. But what happens is you get a peace that surpasses all understanding. Heaven invades you. God places his spirit inside of you. You now have a joy that surpasses all understanding because you have a relationship with an eternal God. You have now received the benefit of eternal life. And although things around you are changing for the better, you have changed for the better. And now you are seeing things differently. You now see the matrix for what it is, and you've signed up to be on the right side of history, and now you have an eternal blessed hope of salvation. You know that you're saved. You know that heaven is your eternal home. You know that you have a Father in heaven who cares about you. You know that you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You know that you have a Savior who died for you. You know that you have a community of people who believe the same thing. And although I'm going through trials and tribulations and difficulties in the earth, I have a hope. But the devil be messing with our mind. And no matter how many times a preacher can say it, it doesn't activate until you believe it. So many times we're in this gap between what the enemy is presenting to us as a lie and what the scripture has presented to us as a truth and getting to the place where we just stand on the truth and trust in what the gospel teaches. It's a leap of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Some of us are waiting to see something, and we need to believe it before we see it. And I'm not talking about a better house. I'm not talking about a mate. I'm not talking about some fancy job or a new car. I'm talking about the peace that surpasses all understanding. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It means that you have to walk and follow Christ beyond what you see. But it's so hard in a culture that's driven by image. But God wants us to see things differently. So we've identified that we were children of wrath by our nature. We've identified that we were operating based on the flesh. We've taught this before that flesh is the seat of sin and rebellion within the person. Flesh is the seat of sin and rebellion within the person. You need to know that within you, inherently, there is your flesh. The flesh within you is the seat of sin and rebellion within you. When you are saved, you're not governed by your flesh. You now have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. But the two of them are at conflict. Watch this, because the seat of the flesh only will be completely eradicated when you are glorified and when you go to heaven. So while you're on the earth, there's still a wrestle between your flesh and your spirit. You hear the truth. In your heart, you know it's right, but your flesh doesn't want to submit. This happens every Sunday. Preacher is preaching. He talking right. (laughs) Ouch, you done stepped on my corns. You done stepped on my big toe. You done stepped on my pinky. And you walk out, and you know what's right, and you agree with it. But now here comes temptation that appeals to your sin nature. Now you're forced with the choice, and Christian maturity and discipleship is learning about the ways of God and making choice after choice based on the leading of the Holy Spirit that I'm going to trust that God's ways are good and better than the ways of my flesh. 
that now as I'm maturing the desires of my heart to be more like Jesus, my desire to live according to God's word, my desire to please my Father is greater than the desires of my flesh. Listen, it doesn't mean that I don't have desires of the flesh. The devil is a liar. There are certain things you're going to desire to the day that you die. But there is a proclamation that the battle is already won. We don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. And God has given us the victory. But sometimes we have to walk in the victory that he's already given. He's placed the Holy Spirit inside of us to teach us and to lead us into all truth. And the battle for us is whether or not we're going to submit to a spirit. Are we going to submit to a spirit every day? Are we going to submit to a spirit every moment? Are we going to submit to his spirit when nobody else is around? Or we're going to submit to his spirit moment by moment, day by day. God has given us the Holy Spirit to help us. But you can either yield to the spirit or grieve the spirit. And more often than not, because we are so used to our flesh, I mean, our flesh has been governing us for, for, for years. And so it takes a level of surrender on a daily basis to retrain ourselves to not submit to our flesh, but to submit to the spirit. It's a wrestle. It's a fight. But it's a fight worth fighting. Oh, it's worth it. Oh, it's worth it. it, It's worth it. It, 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 it's, It's worth it because everything we see around us is a facade. It's not real. It's like the Wizard of Oz. Projecting one thing, but when you pull behind the curtain, you're like, that's it? That's all? You had me thinking that you were it. You had me thinking that you were the, you had me thinking that this is all it's cracked up to be, but I'm looking at it and I'm saying, I should have trusted in faith what God said. And it's so hard because, once again, our culture surrounds us and swamps us and overwhelms us and, 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 and persuades us and deceives us and, and appeals to our flesh and our desires. But God is saying, I want you to develop a new hunger and a new desire. Oh, if you could just learn what it means to trust in me. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Take him at his word. If Jesus said it, I believe it. If the New Testament scriptures teach it, I believe it. And I'm going to trust it and follow it by faith. So the first half of Ephesians 2 just lays out how raggedy we were. Can you admit how raggedy you are? I mean, can we be honest? See, see, being a believer, you got to be self-aware. You got you to gotta be honest. You got to be transparent. And we can be some, some raggedy trash. You ever have a thought that pop in your head? Be like, that's trash. Why would I even sin nature? You ever have a thought you have to pull it down? Because if it gets too high, it might give birth to something. You got to be honest. Take heed lest you fall. Be aware of who you are, who you were, the the rebellion of your flesh. At some point, you have to come to grips with that in order to fully enjoy the beauty of your salvation. But if you don't feel like you were that bad, if you don't feel like you are that bad, apart from Christ, then you're comparing and saying, well, what's the difference? Here's what I'm trying to help you understand, that when you are born again, there is a radical change that happens on the inside of you. You become something of a different substance when you are truly born again. Oh, everything shifts and everything changes for you. It's the beginning of a new journey. And the problem with religion is that that we get caught up in religious activity, and, and, and now the changes are just subtle because we just move from one system of performance to a new system of performance, and we're just doing what the the people in our church do. No, 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 no. You got to understand that when you have been converted, it is a radical inward change. You're supposed to be brand new. And when you really submit to Christ, everything's on the table. 
Everything can be counted rubbish. Why? Because the treasure that you have received is so great and so wonderful and so beautiful. Ephesians chapter 2, the verse, first three scriptures, it tells you the bad news, but it's going to give you the good news. Verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy. Two of the most beautiful words found in scripture, but God. I was dead in my trespasses, but God. Lost in my sins, but God. Straight tripping, crazy, but God. Enemy tried to take me out, but God. Tried to attack my faith, but God. But God. You ought to have a but God in your testimony. I was down to my last dime, but God is Jehovah Jireh and my provider. I had given up on myself because of my wickedness, but God, who is rich in mercy and love, gave me a way of forgiveness according to his scripture. But God was merciful, but God was kind, but God, God steps in and stops the bleeding, but God being rich in mercy. Something is is rich, just lavish, and and, and mercy, it just, 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 just rich, just, just, you ever ate something that's just, it's just rich, it's so it's so rich you can only take just a little bit of it because you eat it and it just goes throughout your whole. It, 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 it's rich. It's heavy. He, he is rich, heavy in mercy because of his great love for which he loves us. Oh, if we understood the love of the Father, if we understood the love of Abba. See, I don't think we really understand the love of God because if we really knew how much God loves us, if we really internalized, received, felt the love, you know how you know somebody really loves you? When they forgive you for something that you did. You know they really love you when they don't discard you after you mess up. You know they really love you when they love you in spite of the fact that your feet stink. In spite of the fact that you don't keep the cap on the toothpaste. In spite of the fact that there are things that you should do that you don't do, the love transcends the transgression. When they choose to love you, knowing what they signed up for, God chooses to love us knowing what he signed up for. He saw the issues, he saw the problem, he saw the transgressions and still said, I want you. The Apostle Paul deals with the concept of adoption in Scripture. Adoption can be seen as a higher form of parenting because when you give birth to a child, that child is yours. You have no choice but to take the child home because the child came from you. And when the child is acting crazy, you got to trace and look back up. It's something that came from me. (laughs) But when a child is adopted, you adopt that child having a full file folder of all the child's issues, the lack of parenting they had before, the no medical difficulties of that child, and you choose to accept that child in spite of all the bad that you already know about them. So when God adopts us into the family, he adopts us knowing in advance all of our problems, all of our issues, Some of us can't even buy a car without looking at the Carfax report. You ever bought a used car? You want to see the report. You want to know how many accidents it was in. You want to see if there are any lien or title issues. You want to see if it has water damage. And if it got too much stuff, you move on. Let me find another car. God looks at us, and the Carfax is a mile long. The exterior is not just dented up. It's banged up, mixed matched. Dirty on the outside and the inside. And yet he says, I'll buy it. With his raggedy self, I'll buy it. I'll pay full price for that which has already been damaged. I'm not going to discount it. I'll pay full price 
of its original value because that's how much I want this vehicle. That's how much I want this soul. That's how much I want this child. I'm going to pay for this child knowing all of her issues, knowing all of her problems. And I'm going to love this child anyway. And I'm going to be patient with this child. Listen, as she grows up to understand what it means to now have a new last name. I'm going to be patient with this child as she learns what it's like to live in this household and to follow by the guidelines of this household. I'm going to be patient with this child because at a certain point, this child is going to mature to be an ambassador of my household. And eventually, this child will no longer have to deal with the reality of the environment in which she was born because I'm taking this child to a place that they've never been before. And when they get there, it'll all make sense. You think Disneyland is a great place to be. Wait till you get to heaven. I got a trip in store for my children, and it's not a temporary trip. It's a permanent place where they will be able to experience all the benefits of fullness of relationship with me. But God, who is rich in mercy. Oh, let me say this to you. God loves 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 you. He wants you to know his love. Listen, he chastises those whom he loves. His love is not a fake love or a false love. His love is one of concern for his children. A parent doesn't love their children if they're not willing to discipline their children. But a good parent knows just enough discipline and just enough reward and just enough incentive to watch that child grow up and to be shaped in their character and their integrity. You need to know that God loves us in spite of there's nothing that we can do to earn his love it's already been purchased for us through Jesus death and resurrection on the cross listen to me when you understand that love everything changes for you because we don't work to be saved but now that we have received love it motivates us to serve God and to do the things that he's asking us to do because we realize how much he loves us have you ever had a friend and you didn't really know where the relationship was until they performed an act of service of love that solidified to you that they were serious about being your friend and what they did was so thoughtful was so beautiful and so awesome that now you're just motivated you're trying to find ways to bless them because they blessed you first when you have real relationship it's not about coercion it's not you know give me a birthday gift because I gave you a birthday gift there is such a love relationship with that person that you, you want to please them you want them to smile You want them to be proud of you. See, when you have significant people in your life and you're doing stuff and you're making decisions, when you have genuine, authentic people in your life, they actually pop in your mind when you're about to do something significant and you actually measure what you're about to do with this person that I trust be proud of the decision that I'm making. With this person that I love, would this be something that would be helpful or harmful towards them? You consider the people that you love, the persons that you love, and I'm here to tell you that God loves you so much. If you understood that love, it would change the way that you move. Some of us are trying to move and serve God apart from understanding the love of God. Just receive his love. Just let him love on you. Well, I'm going through trials and tribulations. He promised never to leave you nor forsake you. His love is present. Sometimes we're looking in the wrong places. Sometimes we're looking for the wrong signs. We're looking for the wrong things. We're we're appealing to the wrong things. And God is saying, you were looking over there, but I was here all the time. Just receive his love. He loves you. He loves you. And it's not that sappy type of love. No, it's that demonstrated love for God's love of the world that he gave. he He put his money where his mouth was. A sacrificial type of love. I'd overlook your false type of love. I don't want to get into like psycho, you know, psychoanalytic type of stuff. And, you know, you've heard the concept of people not really loving themselves. And I believe it's because they don't really understand the love of the Father. If you understood the love of the Father, you see that when God created you, he created you in his image and in his likeness. And that there were certain things that he mandated 
humanity to do, and, and we understand that you are created in the image of God, and we understand that in Christ your identity has changed. When you're born again, you're adopted into the family. It changes the way that you view yourself. We're looking at ourselves, listen to me, from the wrong mirror, from the wrong lens. We're still, compar- we're still using, watch this, the mirror and the lens of the flesh rather than understanding the spirit and the realities of Scripture and the realities of what it means to be in this family. And if we really caught that, we would run towards the things of God. If we really understood, listen, rewards in heaven, if we really understood that, we would, we would, we would, we would make more sacrifices for the kingdom. We would pour ourselves into our service with a different mindset. But, but, but when we are driven too much by the world system that we're in, we begin to wonder, is it really worth it? And what we think we're saving in time and in money here in the earth, we realize that we're missing the opportunity to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. But why do we want to lay ourselves uh, up treasures in heaven? Because we love God. And we trust his word. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us even when we were dead and our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Say that, by grace, grace. I have been saved. Not by works. I ain't bring nothing to the table or the cookout. But Jesus, what do I bring to the cookout? Bring yourself and a contrite heart. Jesus, what do you want me to prepare at this cookout? Nothing. Your macaroni and cheese ain't good enough. <laughs> well, Jesus, can I run to CVS, grab some, some plates? Your plates and your little plates and forks are, are at this table. I just need you to come. I, I just need you to sit and receive what I'm cooking and preparing. Eternal salvation. That's where it starts. Religion is us trying to bring stuff to the table that Jesus didn't ask for. But I got to bring something. I got to do something. Bring yourself. Bring your attention. Bring your heart. And let me prepare for you a table. And as you partake and as you eat and as you are nourished, I will tell you where you need to go and what you need to do. We're saved by grace. The bad news, we were dead in our sins. But the good news is we are alive in Christ. So, the question is, how shall we conduct ourselves after receiving the free gift of salvation? I'm saved by grace. I ain't bring nothing to the cookout. There's nothing that I could prepare in my kitchen that God would receive. So here I am sitting at the table, didn't bring nothing. God is treating me to this lavish meal that I didn't deserve. What happens next? You told me that I'm not led by the law now, so how do I live my life? You told me that I'm not saved by my works, but aren't there things that I should be doing to live right? The answer is yes, but you don't work to be saved. You work because you're saved. And as Jesus feeds you at that table, when you get up and you go, you're taking the food that you've been fed to bring it to other people so that they can be reconciled and sit at the table as well. You are living your life according to what you learn, listen, from Jesus as you sit at this table. The more time you sit at the table of Jesus, the more you listen to him, his word, the more you partake of his food, the Father's, the word that he prepared at the table, and the more you connect yourself with other people who are partaking of that food, the more you understand the ways of the kingdom, the more you're able to live sanctification as you continue to sit at the table of Christ and to receive and to grow and to learn. And as you learn, you make adjustments. As you learn, you make adjustments. As you learn, you make adjustments. It's the progressive work of the Holy Spirit sanctifying you, helping you to become better day by day, but it's not forced. It comes from resting in the presence and the final work of Jesus and allowing yourself to be disciple. And as you learn, you do. As you learn, you do. As you understand scripture, you apply it and you begin to grow up in Christ. It amazes me having a seven-month-year-old child, how much they learn just by being present, just by modeling and watching, just by listening and absorbing and imitating. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. As long as someone's following Christ and aiming to live Christ-like, do the things that Christ did that they are doing, you do it as well. That's how you grow. 
Not through legalism, but through spending time in God's word and learning more about the culture of the kingdom of God and the scriptures and applying it to your life. So yes, there are things that must change in your life. The question is, how do those things change? I believe it comes from just surrendering totally and completely to Jesus and and understanding that it's a process and being open to learn. And when people correct you, getting understanding and and, and making changes and adjustments and trusting things that maybe you don't fully understand, but you are learning and learning how to read the scriptures for yourself. And before you know it, the seven-month-old is now seven and then 17 and then 27. And you realize that you have grown and sometimes you can't even track the growth. But it's because when you were born again, God placed in you his Holy Spirit, and you were changed at that moment, even though you don't realize it. You were changed and transformed, even though you don't realize it. You were born again. You were regenerated. When we're truly born again, we become somebody totally different. God placed the Holy Spirit inside of us. Now the Holy Spirit helps us to live right. The Holy Spirit also helps us to see the world differently. Let's hop to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting with verse 16. The scripture says, therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. Once you are in Christ, you no longer recognize people by the flesh. We're going to talk about what that means in just a moment. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Remember, the flesh is the seat of sin and rebellion in a person's heart. When we are in our flesh, we recognize people by the flesh. We recognize ourselves by the flesh, and we recognize Christ by the flesh. We weren't, listen, we weren't spiritual when we got saved, but we recognized Jesus. And up to a certain point, we probably rejected him until that moment of salvation, and then our eyes were open, and God places the Holy Spirit inside of us, and now that the Spirit is inside of us, we no longer know him according to the flesh. We now know him according to the Spirit. Prior to Christ, we saw everything according to the flesh. Everything. We saw everything according to the flesh. Somebody says something about you, you treat it flesh with flesh. But when you're born again, you can't just hop to doing something in the flesh You have to allow the Spirit to help you process what's going on, and then you have to wait for the Spirit to give you a response according to what you're learning about what it means to live as a believer in Christ. You see everything from a different lens, no longer from the flesh, but now from the Spirit. According to the flesh, we don't know Jesus that way any longer. We don't see people that way anymore. We we no longer uh, recognize people according to the flesh. Everything is different. Prior to Christ, we saw everything in the flesh, But now we see him differently, we see everything else differently, once you're born again. Therefore, from now on, we recognize, that word recognize means to know or to be aware of, no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. Here's the clincher, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if you are in Christ, you are a new creature. The old has passed, behold, The new things have come. A new creature. That word new means something that is original and never seen before. When something is new, it's original. It's never been seen before. It's something entirely new, original. And a creature is a divine creation brought into creation by God himself. Brought into existence. God speaks into existence a new us. We are born again. We become Someone new, someone new, someone original, never seen before. We become someone that that is a new person. We are a new person in Christ. Listen, when you are born again, you have the right to act brand new because you are. I, I, I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this. Religion doesn't make you brand new. Religion just makes you assimilate to what everybody else is doing. Religion, listen, watch this. Religion allows you to show up and do your Sunday thing and still do your Friday night, Saturday thing. That's religion. That's being religious. Religious makes you clean up your speech when you're on church grounds, but you still cuss like. I mean, I'm talking about I'm talking about going in. Because you are practicing religion. It doesn't mean that you 
that you don't slip up from time to time doesn't mean that you don't have moments. But, but behavior, the way we flow, see, see how you start sometimes indicates the direction that you're on. And sometimes we're not starting this thing right. And God wants us to understand the power of being born again and being regenerated. We become something completely new in essence. And if we understand that, then we allow God to help us understand what we have become. You are an original, never seen before creature, a divine creation brought into existence by God himself, and you have the right to act brand new. And I know in today's culture, that's negative. Oh, you acting brand new. We used to do X, Y, and Z, and now you can't pick up my phone. You don't respond to my text messages. You're acting brand new. You got that new job. You're acting brand new. Got that new haircut. You're acting brand new. Got a little money. You're acting brand new. Who you think you are? You've changed. And the answer is yes. I've changed. Because we're supposed to change. We're supposed to grow. We're supposed to grow up. When I was a child, I spake as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. You're supposed to grow up. You're supposed to mature. You're supposed to change. And listen, when there's been an authentic, sincere change in you, you never have to apologize for living right. Stop apologizing for making the right decision. Stop apologizing for going to the places that God told you to go. Stop apologizing for having a different lifestyle than people who aren't willing to sacrifice and to do what you're doing. Listen, sometimes you just got to let people be where they are and pursue who God is calling you to be because you have been changed. The scripture says that the old has passed and behold, new things have come. Your old things have passed. When something has passed away, it's gone out to existence. You ought to have a funeral for who you used to be. You ought to write a eulogy. Here lies my past and what I used to do and where I used to go. Sometimes you got to have just a marked moment where you say, things must be different. I'm not going back. It's past. as what I used to do. Can't go down that path anymore. You have the courage. You have the right to not be ashamed. You have the right to act brand new. You have the right to say, I'm going to make a radical step in the next, gener- in the next direction. Doesn't mean I'm perfect. Doesn't mean that I'm better than anybody. I've just found something that makes me better off, and I must pursue it with everything that I have. Don't let the enemy pull you back into your past When you are a new creature, a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come. Walk forward. Don't go backwards. Allow him to make you into whom he's calling you to be. You have the permission to act brand new when God has changed you. Because you love him more. You have new desires. You have new dreams. You have new hopes. You have new expectations. You have new family. You have a new mindset. You have new pursuits. You have new values. And that just is what it is. It is what it is. You have permission to act brand new. Verse 18 says, Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Oh, if we understood what it meant to be reconciled. You've been reconciled. You were dead in your sins. You were an enemy of God. You've been reconciled. The word reconciliation means to restore someone to friendly relations after a presumed wrong. You were guilty, and God reconciled you. Jesus reconciled you to the Father. You're now on friendly terms with God because of what Jesus did. You're in this love relationship because of what Jesus did. When you understand what you've been reconciled, see, you can't be reconciled without acknowledging the harm that you did and being forgiven for it. When you realize what you've been forgiven for, then it makes the relationship even that much more beautiful and more pure and more wonderful. We have been reconciled. 
We were out of fellowship with God the Father, hopeless with no hope except for surrendering our lives to Jesus, and we have been reconciled, and now heaven will be our home. We're part of this family. God is our Father, and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Why do we reconcile with other people? Because, baby, God reconciled with me. Why do we give mercy to others? Because God gave mercy to me. Why do we forgive other people? Because I have been forgiven when you've been reconciled to God the Father through Christ. He gives us the ministry of reconciliation, verse 19, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting the trespasses against them. He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now, you see this word reconciliation, reconciliation, reconciliation. This is the heart of Christ. We've been reconciled with the Father. He wants us to reconcile with others and to reconcile, be a conduit for others to be reconciled with him. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled with God. And over these past few weeks, I've just been preaching. I've been trying my best to preach the gospel, begging begging the people, be reconciled with God. Life's too short. Be reconciled with God. Be reconciled with God. Get in right relationship with God. Are you born again? Have you been saved? Reconciliation. When it's all said and done, there's life and there's death. There's eternal life and there's eternal damnation. The question is, are people reconciled with the Father? I don't care how nice your drip is, all these different slang and terms and pursuits, it's all going to pass away. The question is, when we're looking no longer from the flesh, are people reconciled with God or have they rejected him? And listen, you can't make nobody do nothing. You can't make them do nothing. You can, you can, you can preach to them, but you can't make them do nothing. But woe is us if we didn't even at least present to them something worth connecting to, which is why we can't be ashamed, which is why we got to live according to what we believe. People need to see something in us. They need to see a transformation, and it's not fake, and it's not plastic. I'm not talking about about a religious starter kit, denominational starter kit. Now you just assemble to, you know, assimilate to whatever denomination you connected to and you just do what they do. I'm talking about genuine inward change. When a person is changed, it's genuine. It's authentic. It's, it's attractive. It repels the demons. But the people who are really hungry, they will be drawn to you and they'll see something different. Does Christ live in you? Or are you just going to church? Are you doing things for Jesus or is the Holy Spirit doing things through you for Jesus? There's a difference and a distinction. And when you are born again, you have yielded yourself to God's divine, miraculous work. Father, I thank you so much for those who are here right now. I thank you, Father. I thank you that we don't have to be ashamed. I thank you, Father that you are giving us permission to to, to act brand new. As we learn more about you, you're giving us permission to, to move differently, to live differently. I pray for continued boldness for those who are Christian believers. Father, you are pushing us to a place where we're not ashamed of the gospel. And I thank you for people who are maturing, dear God, over these past few weeks, who, who, who are, who are, who are overcoming their fears, dear God, of being different. Father, I pray that they would fear and love you more than they fear and love people. I pray, Father, that they would get to the place where they're willing, dear God, to take the path less traveled, understanding and trusting that as long as you're with them, they'll be all right. And for the person that's not saved, Father, I pray that this has been provoking sincere faith and conversion, that people would surrender to Christ and get saved for real. Father, I know that's your work, and we can make the appeal, we can present the gospel, but it's you that saves. So, Father, I pray there be someone in this room or someone on this broadcast who's not giving their life to Jesus, and you have been pulling on their heart, and they will respond and say, yes, I surrender to Jesus. I believe he is the Son of God, and I believe that he died on the cross for my sins, and I believe that he resurrected on the third day, and I trust in it, 
and I trust that I am saved by faith through grace. Father, would you bring salvation to their household now? And Father, we will proclaim and publish your greatness and we'll participate in your ministry of reconciliation. And Father, through a life submitted to you, through humility and through love, we'll present the gospel to others and let them know that the same God that saved us is the same God that can save them. This we pray in the mighty name of Jesus.